My name is Vahid Chitsos, part of Elite Mastermind Group. Thank you for being here this morning. Introduce yourself to everybody. Let us know where you're tuning in from. Can you hear me, brother? I can hear you now. Go ahead. All right. So I'm hearing you like it's a little uh, kind of feedbacky, but like we'll just ride with it. So yeah, my name is um, Aaron Novello. I'm a licensed active real estate agent in uh, Southeast Florida. And um, I have the good fortune of selling, you know, about 170 to 200 homes each year. And I also am uh, also a coach and trainer, right? So I work with about 38 agents across the country um, in a coaching capacity of which about seven of them earn seven figures, right? So I have this unique kind of perspective of not only uh, being in the game, actively listing and selling property each and every day, a lot of kind of coaches and trainers in this space aren't actively engaged in the activity. And I also kind of sit on the sidelines and help kind of guide others uh, through that process, right, of producing in high volume and being a top producing salesperson who happens to sell real estate. Let me ask you a question. What, are, what do you see uh, in your space, the top two challenges that most agents face in selling? What is the biggest, I mean, it doesn't have to be real estate. Yeah. What are the two common challenges that you constantly see? Yeah. So two common challenges that I constantly see is this like illusion of choice. So by that, what I mean is, is like a lot of people get into this game and they don't understand what it actually is. And what it actually is, is a hardcore sales business. It's no different than selling books door to door, knives door to door or subscriptions over the phone. Right. And as such, it has to follow the same sales process. So any business that's in sales, I have to prospect every day. A day not spent prospecting is a day not spent in business, right? I have to be able to have the skill of setting appointments uh, with clients because they're not just going to fall over each other and be like, hey, man, your hair looks really nice. I think I want to set an appointment with you, right? I have to have a skill to be able to do that, right? I have to be able to pre-qualify those appointments to ensure that they have the means and the motivation to actually do something when I meet with them, right? Sign a contract. Then I have to be able to present and give them a compelling reason to choose me versus somebody else. I have to be able to handle objections and then I gotta be able to close. So one of the biggest challenges that I see people have in this industry, because there's an 80% attrition rate, Vahid. So 80% wow. of people, when they get their license within five years, they're doing something else. And the wow. main reason is, is that they just have this illusion that they have a choice, like they get to choose whether or not they prospect or not, or they get to choose whether or not they work on their skills or not. And that's an illusion because if you really want to be productive and you really want to, um, you know, earn meaningful amounts of money, then you have to embrace the fact that you don't have a choice and you have to do those things. I agree with that. In Los, I mean, in LA or, or I should say California in 2005, one of the, peaks of real estate ever in the history of our state, 480,000 homes were sold in that given year. There were yeah. over 500,000 agents. So if one agent was good and sold 10 to 20 homes in one year, that means like 40 or 50 didn't sell any. So well, yeah. definitely when it comes to that, and I, but here's my question though, you must have said the same thing on your Instagram account at least 20 times that I could probably co point out. Literally every other video, you say the same yeah. thing. Are there people that are still not getting it? Yeah, so um, you know what I'm aware of is you need an accurate assessment of reality in order to produce a good outcome. And if I was to say this, like let's say we were in a room right now with like 5,000 people, which we should do by the way, Bahid. And, uh, I, I said to people like, hey, knowledge equals, everybody would say power, right? But here's what's interesting. What if I'm operating under the wrong knowledge? Or what if I know, the problem for most of us is not that we don't know, it's that we don't do what we know. So if I was in a room full of people and I was like, hey, how many of you guys know how to lose weight? How many of you guys understand the way that process works, right? Got to eat less and exercise, great. Do you need a PhD to figure that out? No. Excellent. How good is that information doing most people? Not that not, good. Not that good, right? So it's the application of what I know that's so important. So 
Yeah, I mean, I can sit in a room and tell people this, and they still continue to operate it under the illusion that, like, oh, well, that's not like me, and like, I don't really feel like it, and that's not my style. And I'm like, that's cool, but if you want to actually be productive, this is what you got to do. I love it how people think that communicating and talking to brand new people, like, I don't understand. How many moms and dads, cousins, nephews, uncles, and neighbors could you possibly have? that you want to offer your services to. Yes. Like, this is true with every business. Like, how could you think that your mom is going to buy a home from you every single six months? Like, how are you going to stay in business? I mean, you could have any, even a supermarket that we probably use every week, if not every other week we're using, even they know that they, they need to be marketing. Like, everybody knows where Ralph's is at, Vaughn's. You know, I don't know what supermarkets you guys got in Florida, but everybody knows where they're at. They're huge. They're gigantic. Like, you cannot miss them going to. But they still do advertising. I still see their mailers come through, all that. So someone like, how could you as an agent or somebody who's offering their services, right? How could you think that people are just going to come to you naturally? Like, there's got to be some action on your side to say that I am here. Well, I don't get that concept. I, yeah, maybe so I don't maybe, well, no, I'm right there with you. And what I'm aware of is what I share with people like at seminars and stuff. It's like, okay, in one hand are the people you know. And the other hand is the people you don't know. Which one's bigger? <laughs> the, the one, I love the ones that I don't know because then <laughs> right? I wouldn't care if they say no to me. That's, That's the right. crazy thing. And what I'm, person. 100%. And what I'm also aware of, one of the things I share with people, I call them the four noble truths of real estate because – if people really knew me, Vahid, like if they really knew me, they might see me now and be like, oh man, he sells hundreds of homes. He coaches all these people. He's got online classes in 23 countries and eight languages. But if you really knew me, you would know that in my first calendar year of selling real estate, I only made 13,000 bucks. And that's great. Listen, well, that's good because I know some big guys who didn't sell anything for the first two years. Yeah. So, and, but what I'm aware of is, is like, that is not something that people would put you on a podcast to talk about. They would oh, definitely, definitely not definitely not hire you to like, you know, teach them how to do it, right? So, but it's like, how is that possible? How do you go from making $13,000 a year in, in your first calendar year to then selling hundreds of homes a year and grossing over a million dollars? Like, how do you do that? Well, um, I was operating under faulty knowledge, faulty information. Somebody was telling me like, hey, you need to sit and do open houses. You need to wait for people to show up. Somebody was telling me you need to farm a geographic area. I was like, farm? Like, what are you talking about? Like, I'm not in agriculture. Like, what, what, what is this, right? They were telling me to put my face, like, on, like, uh, at, the, at the time before the internet was a big deal in, like, uh, advertising, like, on magazines and stuff. And because it was mediocre information, what mediocre information always produces is mediocre results, period. So once I got an accurate assessment, and one of the accurate assessments of reality is that the money's not in the service for heat. It's in the selling of the service. So point being for all of your followers, right? It was like, okay, how many of you guys has a license, whether it's insurance license, real estate license that allows you to perform a service? And everybody raise their hand. Great. Do we all make the same amount of money? Why? Some people know how to sell the service better than others. So it's the selling. It's in the selling of the service. That doesn't mean we, get, we don't give people great service. The great service but is hey, expected. A lot of people are just allergic to the word selling. Like yes. to me, I, I'm, I was a little bit allergic at the beginning because I used to own an auto body repair shop and I never learned any selling. I just figured if I can do diagnostics on the car, tell them what the problem is, educate them on how much it costs, what do they need to do, what are the preventive things that they need to do, take about five, ten minutes, have that conversation. You know, I had a very high ratio of people telling me, take care of it, thank you so much, when can we pick it up? So to me, I never went through the traditional sales. I never went through any course. It just, I went through the educational. You'd be surprised how many people, just like my wife and my mom, I had to educate them on when they were wearing high heels and they were riding their brakes for 30 minutes at a time. Yeah. And they're wondering why the shop was ripping them off, why they needed brakes every 12 months. Yeah. So literally, when I found out, I was like, I would go inside their car. I'm like, listen. You got these sandals sitting here and you got these high heels. If you wear the sandals while you drive, you save $500 every year. If you wear these high heels, every year you're going to come see me and you're going to do the brakes. You get to choose. 
They're like, oh, you didn't know that. I was like, this is the number one. So when I educated them on what the problem was, because no other mechanic has ever talked to them like that because they all assume that they just don't know it. They're just female. They just don't know. That was not yeah. the case. If you educated them on it, they will learn. They were intelligent people, and they will just learn. So to me, that's how I do my selling, yeah. if you want. I'm more well, like and, an educator. Yeah, and that's great. And then what I would propose is, is what I would add on to that is then I would call them once a month and say, hey, I just wanted to touch base with you and see how you're doing. I know we had the good fortune of helping you in the last situation. I guess I'm curious, do you have any friends, neighbors or loved ones who are looking for a mechanic who's honest and gives great service? Oh man, 75% of my clients were female, Aaron, and so many shops were just completely, they hated me, man. Because right. reality is this, females, Pay generally speaking ten to about thirty percent higher for the same service at an auto repair shop yeah. versus guys. Guys would just go buy their parts, bring it, do this, do that. They try to fix it themselves, do all these weird things that they do. But guess what? I have I, I found out that if I give good service and initially build personal relationship with them, take a little bit of a time, and I did there and lose some business because I used to take my time with the clients. And the ones in the line, they didn't want to wait for me to get to them. So sometimes I lost business because I was taking my time with the current ones that I was talking to and ha having a conversation with, right? But then I realized when I would build a relationship, referrals was just natural. Now, I didn't do the calling back then. It was a little bit different. It wasn't all. Yeah. If, I go, if I ever open the shop again, man, I could kill 95% of all these R repair shops. Yeah. Like completely, I could wipe them out. Yeah. If I come into town, like they got a cool shop, because what I know today, ooh, is a stealth man, it's stealth for sure. And what I was, what I've been sharing with people a lot is like, um, you know, with everything that's going on, is like I stay ready, so I don't have to get ready. So I haven't missed a day of prospecting in eleven years. Like I have twenty thousand hours of practice of like scripts and dialogues and all that other stuff. So like, you know, I'm built for this type of environment because while everybody's contracting. Like I can expand into the marketplace. I know what to say. I have no problem speaking to people that I don't know, right? I have no problem, um, you know, being on the phone for three hours a day, five to six days a week because I've acknowledged and accepted that that's what this is. This isn't HGTV. This isn't like millionaire listing. That's not the real world, bro. You're the real world. Against Bravo TV right now. Totally I know. But I like some of the other truth. shows. They're very scripted. It's not, it, it doesn't have that much to do with, with reality, but it doesn't. It's fine. It's not it's real. It's it's entertainment. That's what it's called. So I mean, listen. The only way that you know me is because I contacted you. I didn't know you. Yep. That's that's definitely prospecting for this live sessions that we got. Oh, a thousand percent. And what I'm aware of is by me being on this call, I get introduced to your people, and that's a form of me prospecting, right? So like, it's it's a win-win proposition. Definitely. And, and, and oh, so here's my other question. During the first 12 months, I'm yeah. pretty sure there were a lot of people that didn't agree with the path that you're going because $13,000 in 12 months, that's not that much. Even if you live in the worst area in yeah. the United States. Like that's not, so who was supporting you, number one? Number two, how did you survive all the bazookas, the RPGs, the bullets that were coming at you saying you're in the wrong field, you shouldn't be doing it. See, it was God, it was meant like you shouldn't be doing this, that license, yeah. that, all of these negative things that I'm pretty sure you heard. But if you got any weird ones that you haven't heard of, just share it with us. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the first thing is um, my wife, uh, she had a job at the Princeton Review and she wasn't making too much money either. And, uh, but her money would actually pay our bills, right? So we lived really kind of simply within our means. And that made it for me where I like, I didn't, I didn't actually have to like earn a huge amount of money just to be able to uh, stay afloat. So that was extremely helpful. And then the other thing that I did is I surrounded myself with people um, who were on the path or further along the path and they could either be living or not living. So I started to like read probably three or four books a month of people who had accomplished really big kind of uh, meaningful things. Um, I started to surround myself with other individuals who were further along the path 
right? Who could say like, yep, this is the right thing to do. Like you're in the right spot with the right person. You just need to make yourself more valuable. So what I learned along the way, Vahid, is like, it's like, don't wish it was easier, wish you were better. Don't wish for less problems, wish for more skills. Like I gotta get better at what I do. And as I become more valuable as a human, whether it's through my time management, whether it's through my consistency, whether it's through my communication, then what ends up happening is in an economic sense, uh, I get rewarded for that, right? So um, yeah, I think it was just a combination of uh, support for my wife and then also surrounding myself mentally with books and mentors, whether they be living or I don't have to be in contact with them and people around me um, that were farther along the path who could say to me like, yeah, and like, this is, you're in the right spot. Like you're planting seeds right now. And if we make a couple tweaks, like here's how we, we could take it to the next level. How hard was it for you to seek mentorship in the initial years? Because you didn't have much to offer or who was the person that took you under their wing or how did that process happen? Yeah, so what I did is I recognized very quickly that, um, again, like I needed an accurate assessment of reality because the assessment I was getting from the population of like, you know, agents was just, it wasn't accurate. It was really slow. Um, it was very reactive, waiting for people to come meet. It's very low on rejection. And I had big outsized goals and objectives. And I'm like, that's not, that's not going to work, right? So uh, I hired a coach, man. I was professionally coached for 11 years continuously with no break. Right. I paid somebody a thousand dollars a month for 12 years to teach me. Right. Not only the mental maps and the philosophies, but also specifically what to say and how to say it. Right. Because I understood and that, that's a person in real estate or that's just a person in, in, in sales skills. No, it was a person specifically in real estate. And what that allowed me to do is because what what you're paying for is proximity. So people who I work with now. You know, because that's my way of kind of contributing, right? So, so I'm further along in that journey, and now I can kind of give back and pour into other people. And what they're paying for is proximity. So they're getting my undivided attention. I can condense decades worth of learning into days, weeks, or months. It's kind of like if we're on like a journey and we're going into the jungle, and he looks at me and he's like, yo, I want to get to that mountain up there. And I'm like, great, brother, I've been there. So here's the deal. I got a map. And I can tell you like, hey, but he don't eat those berries. I ate them and it didn't work out well. I could be like, yo, <laughs> which, do, right? I could be like, hey, exactly. the most important part. Right? So that's but how valuable that is. To do. Things not to do. Yes. And, and what I'm aware of is that's hugely valuable because what's true is, but he, you could probably get to that mountain on your own. But what will happen is, is you'll end up like, you know, bruised and broken and sick and like all this other shit. So it's like, hey. I might as well get there as quickly as I can. And the best way to do that is to get access, again, proximity to somebody who's powerful. So what I'm aware of is like you were saying, like what value can I bring? Like for people, they need to recognize like, yes, I can add value to a mentor in some way. But the other thing to consider is like, there's a, you know, like I can pay them. I get access to their, to their knowledge, to their mental map, to their map because they've been where I want to go. Oh, accurate knowledge is the most important thing because I was telling one of my friends and he's like, Vahid, you're so good at social media. I was like, no, man, I actually suck at a lot of this stuff. I just figure it out. I just do it faster than everybody else. I'm just trying to do it. But then he goes, well, I went on YouTube and I found this guy, you know, blah, blah. I was like, is that guy doing it today? Have you seen that guy on a live session? He's like, no. I was like, then why are you getting advice from someone who's obsolete, who's talking right. about social media growth? A year ago, I said, what I know about three months ago is already obsolete. So if you're watching a video of a guy who said something about social media a year ago, like push the delete button on, on YouTube because that video ain't going to do much for you. Unless they're talking about just general information, that's the difference. But if you want to go learn specifically what's going on, real estate, financial services, my mom's hair salon, auto, every industry has changed and has upgraded just in the last three months, let alone past 12 months. So if you're learning from people that are obsolete themselves and they're not in the game, I don't know how you can become successful. Like, it yeah, so here, yeah, so here's what's interesting is what I would propose is there's people out there that are DJs. So they DJ data. They, they see somebody like me on stage and they're like, yo, that was dope. And then they DJ it out to the crowd, right? 
And then there's people that are like the interviewers. That's cool too. So they get proximity to powerful people and by that, by association, they become powerful themselves. Awesome. But then there's people that are creators or content. Okay. There, there are people that like actually are not infopreneurs just selling information, but they actually apply mm -hmm. and do stuff at a huge volume. And then they just happen to monetize the skill. Okay. So what I would propose is, is like, if you want to, if you want to know about like jewels, don't go to a baker, man. They don't know shit about jewels. If you want to know about like, you know, real estate, go to somebody who's selling 200 homes a year. Like they can help you. If you want to know about social media, see Vahid. He's got almost 400,000 followers. Like, you know, he would know about that. I'm too busy, man. Don't, don't DM me. I'm too busy. Don't DM me. Uh, but I see what you're saying. It's like, you got to go to the right people. And here's the crazy part. You know, I was talking to one of my friends about financial services and how you got to do planning. And I said, listen, when your car breaks down, you go to an auto mechanic. When your body breaks down, you go to a doctor. When you need real estate or, or accounting, you go to those. But what happens when you want to run your business? Who do you go to? A lot of people go to their mechanic and their doctor and their, their hairstylist asking about business advice when these guys are not making six figure themselves. So you got to also be asking the right question from the right person who can take your hand to the next level. Like if I was going to go into real estate, I'd be calling Aaron, Mark Aaron. Um, I, I need to back in your office. I need to be in your office to listen how you make those phone calls. Because I saw your boiler room over there. You got like yeah. 15 people jumping up and now making calls and yeah. prospecting. I was like, good for you. When I saw that video, I was like, this is a guy who's, who's in the trenches where yeah. his team is going to respect him because he's in the room. It's not like sitting on the Zoom saying, you guys go make the calls, report back to me. Bullshit. Yeah. I'm in the room. Give yeah. me the objection, rejection. What happened? How did this go? Why yeah. don't you say this? Say that. Change this. You know it better. Precisely. So what are you doing that course? <laughs> yeah. So, so what, what companies do is there's a handful of companies that hire me to do like prospecting schools for them. So they'll fly me out and they have that room. And then I sit in the room and agents have headsets on and then I click into them and I tell them what to say. And then they set appointments. So it's like live interactive coaching. Right. So, so not only am I in the room, but I am the room brother. Like I can hop on the phone with anybody and rock and roll. You know what I'm saying? So yeah, like, that's where, that's where there needs to be congruency, right? It's not like, this isn't some shit like I read out of a book and I'm like, oh, this is cute. And I'm trying to be clever. It's like, no, nah, dude, I do this every day. I, I, when I started in financial services about 11 years ago, when I started with this company, I was, uh, I had nobody in the area that I walked into, I wanted to be closer to my mom. So I moved from LA to the Valley area that I'm in. I literally did not know I mean, my mom knew a lot of people. I didn't know anybody. I made one call. I followed up with this lady. She was about 75 years old. I followed up with her for about three and a half months. And I took some bullets, Aaron. I took some bullets. Like, she went at me, man. I was a rookie. Like, she went at me crazy. Like, she ripped me new ones every time I talked to her. But guess what? From that one single phone call that I did, I calculated, I made over $150,000 just right. from the referrals that came through. Now, that was accumulation of almost like six years of, you know, sending people to me, referring people, and yeah. then me getting referrals. So total, when you trace it back from that one call, I made a six-figure income, and it was not easy taking yeah. bullets from this lady. Well, and like I'm aware, like that's your job, dude. So like, it's kind of like if let's say uh, you're the guy who cut your grass showed up and he was like, "Hey, Vahid, I'm kind of a big deal." And you're like, "What is it, bro?" And you're like, "I cut grass every day." Okay, that's your job, dude. Like, why? Why do you want to tap like slap on the back for that? So it's like when I tell people I haven't missed a day of prospecting in 11 years, they're like, "Oh my god!" I'm like, "Dude, that's my job. That's what like I'm supposed to do, right?" And one of the mindset games like that I used to play with myself is I have a journal. I call it a prospecting journal. And I would write out like, okay, this was an expired listing. So somebody who listed with another agent and that didn't sell, I called them the morning it came off the market. I earned their business and it sold. And I'll be like, okay, this is how much that equated to, right? In terms of a commission, but then I'll follow it out like you did, right? So I have a whole journal filling that up so I can bombard my brain with the idea that this activity is directly correlated with all of my goals and objectives, with all of my dreams, right? Everything I want to accomplish for myself and the people that are around me. 
if I will just embrace this activity and stay consistent and get masterful at it, then, you know, the sky's the limit. You know, I heard this story uh, in a place where Napoleon Hill had a, had a challenge. He was going through a difficult time and he actually picked up his own book, read his own book and solved the problem. So sometimes yeah. journaling and going back, because we're a human being, we're going all over the place. So when you go back to the original source that actually worked and review it, that just does that. Listen, thank you so much for taking this time. And be, how do people find you? What's up with that? Yeah, how do we yeah, yeah. You? Yeah, so they can find me at Aaron Novello, A-A-R-O-N-N-O-V-E-L-L-O. -L -L -O. Um, also for the coaching and training and speaking, that's www.aaronnovello.com. I created classes, right? Uh, seven of them that are online. We bundled them all up about what to say and how to say it, how to talk to expires. I did 100 deals one year, Fahid, and 75 were expired listings. So I'll give you the script of what to say and how to say it. Uh, I did one for for sale by owners, people trying to sell their home on their own, the listing presentation, price adjustments, things of that nature, bundled it all up, basically give it away to people for free for about 50 bucks because I want to equip them because what I'm aware of is what stops people getting on the phone is not knowing what to say. So, um, you know, if, if they go to my Instagram underneath that uh, in my bio, there's a link to the bundle. They can get it there. And if I can help you, DM me like I'm, I'm here to military. serve. U.S. military. It spends billions of dollars in soldier trainings. So when they aim the gun and they got the trigger, they got to be able to pull the trigger. They don't care if they hit the target or not. Yeah. But them not being able to pull the trigger causes more casualty than them taking the pushing the trigger, right? Exactly. Because they don't take the action and they don't pick up the phone and they don't talk to people, they get killed in the battlefield. So actually being able to pick up the phone and talk to people or text or email, whatever your favorite method is, right? For me, it's phone call, right? But if you don't pull the trigger, there's a lot of casualty. And the reason why most people don't get there is because they don't know what to say. So if you That's fix right. that, so many people will have much better careers. That's exactly why I created that bundle, brother, because I want to give it to people and equip them. I've made it so inexpensive. Like, it's not an issue, dude. Like, I want to give it away so that way... You keep, that, that's no longer an issue. Thank you so much for taking this time and being with us. Hopefully we could get through a little bit more collaboration. And listen, let's get into yeah. a room with 200 people, 100 people, I don't care. Let's get in a room with one person, change one person's life, and then we'll domino effect from there. Thank you so Hell much yeah, for being here this morning. Appreciate you, man. Be well. Talk to you later. Bye-bye.